Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to V with Mike G, the show of life, the show of whiskey, the show of Melbourne, Austin, Polanco, Texas, and so much more. It's really a pleasure to share a live podcast interview. I was recently in San Antonio at Blue Box for Bartender's Holiday, and I was hosting a panel called You Make Whiskey Where? And on the panel, we have Jordan Kaiser from Still Austin, Blair Alt from Milam and Green, and Jake Huckey from Star Wars Whiskey, the Australian one. We talk about terroir, we talk about music, we talk about tasting notes and everything in between. Quite a great chat, especially in front of a wonderful audience. There's some laughs, there's a little bit of noise suppression, so you don't get the full resonance of those laughs. But what a great time, and thank you, Justin Elliott, for coordinating. But without further ado, a live taping of You Make Whiskey Where? So this is like the third or fourth live one I've done. Jake, you know, podcasting. This is the only panel I've sat on where you all might have more experience podcasting than I do. So if they try to lead the conversation, you might see this happening here over the, this next hour. But, uh, but And you got one mic, though, so you're going to have to kind of wrestle through it. So we're talking, we're in San Antonio, and we're going to be talking about amazing whiskey. And I believe the name of this panel is You Make Whiskey Where? Or You Make Whiskey How? Or in Australian's case, you make whiskey why, right? So there's a bunch of things to kind of consider as we talk about this. But we've got a great panel. We've got Jordan, Jake, and Blair. I want to first know, though, whiskey brings us all together, but this wasn't how you got into the industry, right, Jordan? I think you said you were working in tech first. Yes, I was working in uh, what they call corporate America, right? I've heard of that. uh, you know, long story short, it was a blessing in disguise to start as a volunteer with Still Austin Whiskey. And it was, uh, you know, jumping ship to join Still was honestly the best decision I ever made. So, what about you, Jake? Obviously, you've been doing podcasting about the industry, but how'd you get into whiskey itself? Even though I was getting paid for my first job, it felt like a volunteer based on the amount of money I was making. Um, <laughs> the distillery will rename Nameless. Uh, <laughs> oh, the I, one from the place where you live. Yes. Maybe, okay. There maybe, we go. That maybe, makes sense. Maybe, maybe so. <laughs> um, I actually started started uh, doing photography and graphic design work, kind of straight out of college, back in like 2010 for some bars yeah. locally to me, and doing some graphic design work and developing labels for some small breweries and freelance writing in the brewery scene. And then in 2015, I started working part-time for Koval Distillery in Chicago. That's right. Um, and that eventually transformed into a full-time job. And here I am now uh, just uh, selling some Australian booze across the United States. I reckon this is a Tuesday afternoon and we're all drinking whiskey. So it's this a, is the kind of career trajectory I think we all aim for. Right. Yeah. I didn't know it studying as a 24-year-old, but I know it now. This is where I'm meant to be. This is you always exactly. look back and learn from your youth, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Or, in my case, elderliness. Oh. Justin and I share that together. Oh, and for you, Blair, how did you get into this industry? Uh, well, yes, a uh, very windy uh, way, for sure. Uh, I, I was a high school teacher who bartended. Well, what? Uh-huh, yeah. I taught uh, various subjects for about seven years in the uh, Hiram Clark neighborhood of Houston, Texas. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but when I was bartending, I was bartending at whiskey bars uh, in Houston, Poison Girl, being the one that has the most American whiskey, uh, it it's a library of its own. Uh, and I started a whiskey podcast, the Whiskey Women podcast, that actually led me to Milam and Green being uh, a women-owned and operated whiskey that I had to uh, talk about and talk about so much that now I work for them. <laughs> did they did they hear the podcast? Uh, not it it w- once. I introduced myself as like, hi, I'm with the Whiskey Women Podcast. Yeah. They they listened, uh, both our, our founder, Marsha Milam, and our master blender, Heather uh, Heather Green, they both listened to episodes after they hired me, but uh, it was not actually, 
yeah, it was uh, it was more the I could literally could not stop talking about it to all the people <laughs> at the Houston Whiskey Social and um, talked my way into a job. It really. kind of seems like they're listening too. Jake, does the podcast for you also, does that ever give you opportunities? Was this how you met the folks from Star Wars or no? Uh, actually, yeah. I was in between um, full-time gigs in the whiskey world and I was just freelancing doing some writing here and there and some photography work, all that kind of stuff, working for some local breweries. And I went to a whiskey festival on behalf of my podcast and uh, of the Media Pass and met our founder, Dave Vitale. And within about an hour of conversation, he offered me a job to be there. What? Yeah. You're pretty charming. You know that, yeah? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. Well, my, of course. My, my you're, wife, you're also my, extremely humble. So uh, <laughs> My wife doesn't think so. I can tell you that much. But, <laughs> they never um, do. They never do. They never yeah. appreciate us. Um, no, and so about a, after a beer or two over at Goose Island in Chicago, we uh, he's like, so you want to do this? I'm like, do what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just had your whiskey for the first time maybe an hour ago. I had heard the brand, but um, they are just kind of officially launching in the U.S. This is back in the spring of 2019, so... Um, was the first U.S. hire for Star Wars, and here we are four and a half years later. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So the podcast, you know, I kind of thought of it as um, there's a website called Good Beer Hunting based out of Chicago. Mm-hmm. I used to write for them, and I told Michael, who's the owner of it at the time, I want to be the good beer hunting for whiskey in Chicago. Yeah. And he's like, just do it. Go roll with it. So the podcast came out of that, and wherever I could get access into for events, I would just kind of, uh, you know, show up with a pass i guess if you will <laughs> and that one led me to uh, a great conversation with dave vitale who is the founder of star Wars, and now i get to sh- sell his whiskey all across america i love that yeah yeah i mean I, I gotta say podcasting has allowed me to meet all the three of you right so it's been kismet because i've known justin a while we hardly have anything to talk about anymore I've known each other like 10 years so <laughs> this is really riveting versus having a, a cocktail <laughs> with justin but jordan you you spent some time at still on on the still before you jumped into the sales role, how long were you doing that? That's right. So I actually started with Still Austin as a volunteer, as I mentioned, for almost a year. And during that time, I was actually still with my prior uh, corporate job. Uh, so I was getting paid for my volunteership, just not by Still Austin at the time. So, <laughs> um, But it was uh, in the works for several months for me to uh, join the team in some aspect. And when our founder asked if I wanted to join the team, I was like, wow, thank you so much you have, a, you have a sales job for me like thank you so much he was like well no i don't uh <laughs> would you want to distill without any prior experience and i was like uh sign me up that's yeah. great so you know hindsight it's awesome that i've been a part of the distilling parts of our brand yeah. and uh, i learned from our head distiller john Chappelle and ryan rivera uh during those two years of what we do and what others do compare and contrast and it's just been nothing but help for for what i currently do now i love that you know, it, there's a lot of brands, and we have this beautiful back bar here at Blue Box, and we're talking about, in most cases, Texas whiskey and a, a whiskey from Melbourne, right? But sell me. You know, a lot of the times I just want to talk about life and things, and perhaps that's where I meander. Jake might have a f- theory on how you host a podcast, and that's good, right? But, like, what makes Still Austin special? If someone says, I have brands coming at me all the time, what is your point of difference? differentiation for lack of a better phrase there's a lot of aspects about us that are my favorite but if i had to choose it's really just the authenticity of our brand and the spirits we make and i like to tell people when i do give tours like hey we have nothing to hide you want to come look at our mash bill our recipes you can and uh there's something special about that as opposed to everything we eat and drink nowadays you know you have to read the nutrition facts or you're not sure what's really in it we have been authentic since ground zero yeah. from literal grain to glass and we want to share that with the world and we want to share it with uh locals and that leads to my other favorite part is just us being able to support local in every sense of the word from our artwork on our beautiful bottles yeah. to the local farmers that get our spent grain every single day for free uh we always look to give back to the community and it's 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 been a great ride and it's been cool to be a part of a brand from you know, like I said, ground zero six years ago, how far we've come and we've never lost that spirit, for lack of a better yeah, word, yeah. right? We've always kept it authentic, we've kept it real, and we just love supporting people around us and sharing a glass. So thinking about authenticity, I've been in Austin a long time, you're mm-hmm. in Buda, but obviously we work in Austin quite a bit. What do you think is like one element that really connects that is Austin, but is still Austin? Partying, quality, 
I'm not going to say this third one on the east side. But anyway, there's many aspects. Mm-hmm. But what do you think is the, the trait that resonates the most between the brand and what it is like actually to be in Austin? Yep. So I'm going to be a little biased here. It's for me and, you know, I've had family that lived in Austin all my life. I'm born and raised in Texas, but southeast Texas. Um, and the most appealing part of the area to me was the music specifically. Oh, yeah. Uh, being a bu- musician myself, I just wanted to be around more uh, music, more shows, more people yeah. that create in any aspect. But it's really the music to me that has always been a part of Austin, not still Austin's, but Austin's story that's still relevant mm-hmm. today. And, you know, big venues popping up all the time to host big acts, but my favorite ones are the ones that are, you know, maybe free or five bucks to get into and it's a band you've never heard who doesn't like going to a show from a band you've never heard of or artist and just having a good time and rocking out to stuff you don't know that's still part of austin and it's honestly one of the reasons we chose to call our first flagship product our our first bourbon um the musician yeah it makes a lot of sense and then for those of you who know austin two words liberty lunch anybody gets that yes perfect fugazi five dollars always so Jake, <laughs> Jake, same thing f- for you. I, I, I reckon for me, at least, as I interpret it with Star Wars, the proximity to wine culture is something that would absolutely influence the whiskey. But for you, what's something that makes it different and not novel, but intrepid and bold? Yeah, I, mean, I think with a lot of people probably listening or and or here, um, bourbon was probably our first love in the whiskey scene. Yeah. Um, that was mine as well. Like my grandpa was an engineer for Jim Beam. What and, really? Yeah. So like I kind of like got to hang out in Kentucky a lot as a kid. And for me, it wasn't the it wasn't the whiskey that was attracting to me. I didn't really drink till I was twenty one years old. But it was the stories that I heard from him. And so kind of relating it back to Star Wars and being Australian whiskey. As much as American bourbon is to America, Star Wars is that to Australia. Is that right? Yeah. Was so, there, is there like a deep whiskey culture there currently? Or did you all kind of growing. ignite it? Uh, we did not. Um, Bill Lark of Lark Distilling, he is the one that really set it off uh, about 30 years ago. Okay. Revi- revived it back in Tasmania where there was no culture of distillation based on a long history of uh, distilleries dying out, um, a lot of the effects of the world wars, a lot of the effects of prohibition in America, and then kind of a self-prohibition the country put on themselves about the amount of distillation it would take to operate a distillery at very really? high numbers. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. So by the, by the 1980s, there was no distillation happening in Australia. And then Bill Lark um, started got the laws changed and revamped much like what happened in chicago with few and um cobal getting mm-hmm. those laws changed revamped pre uh, those were prohibition laws that were set in stone for basically you know 80 years right 90 years um so bill had it all changed dave our founder learned underneath bill oh okay. uh, yeah he tutored underneath him and started making whiskey down in tasmania and eventually moved back to melbourne to create star ward and what our approach with star ward is about making it more scotch than scotch is to scotland making it as much as bourbon is to america and that first part about making it more Scotch than it is in Scotland is that everything we use is purely Australian, including the red wine cast that we yeah. fully mature Sh- in. Shiraz? Yeah. yeah, Shiraz is the main approach. Um, definitely uh, Australian sherry oh, as well. Sh- wait, 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 wait. Well, I shouldn't call it Australian sherry. Okay, that, well, well, that's a whole other podcast. Yeah, yeah, but I, yeah, that's, yeah, intri- yeah. that's intriguing, though. A para, it's oxi- a para, a short for aperitif. A uh, fortified it, wine, if you will. Thank you. See, he's good at his job. You can tell. He knows but, how to uh, show. But yeah, so yeah, we use wine casts from all over the country and those wine barrels are only coming from distinctly Australian vineyards and we're using local farmers, using their grains to build our whiskey and then everything is produced at Star Wars. Not uh, everything since day one, 16 years ago almost, we have produced everything ourselves. Wow. Yeah. Do you, do you find it the malt category a little more challenging than bourbon and i know that the smile indicates that's a that. that's a that's a handful or i don't know a mouthful of conversation right there well how about this since we're not filming yeah and it's only audio give a thumbs up or thumbs down no one will know unless you're here yeah <laughs> got it perfect uh, right that's, in the middle baby. that's a joaquin phoenix thing by the way from yeah. gladiators so yeah. you get it or uh street fighter we've been good, very good <laughs> very good um, i love ambivalence i really do yeah. Great. um yeah it, single malt is such a it's a finicky category with Americans. Obviously, like the the one percent of drinkers know what Scotch is, yeah, and they know what single malt stands for, and then they might carry their way their palate into American single malts, which I hope is like the next big thing in America sure. when it comes to whiskey. But then you have this whole new category of world single malts mm. and people that are replicating what has been happening 
in Scotland, in Ireland, in Japan over the last couple of centuries. Yeah, yeah. Not just, you know, a couple of decades. We're replicating what has been happening for generations and generations. Yeah. And we honor that approach with sing making single malt whiskey by using a Del Pot still distillation that's happening in Scotland. But then we put it in, in these red wine casts and let the temperature, just like the distilleries uh, I'm in between right now in yeah. Texas heat, letting the weather of Texas really ha find those variations in the weather, use that towards your advantage when barrel aging down here much like we do in Australia. Yeah, I love that in Melbourne. And I hear it's a party city, so is that fair? I, I wouldn't know anything about that. That's absolutely true. He's yeah. a good Whenever Christian I go to boy, Melbourne, everybody. I go there for business and business only. Yeah, pleasure is a stupid yeah, thing yeah. to explore when Same you travel. Same thing happens in Chicago, San Antonio, wherever I am in this country. Yeah, yeah, heard. yeah, yeah. I don't even know what partying is. Yeah. With hair like that, I got to tell you, that's bull. My, anyway. my, 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 my dad was a high school principal. I never partied. Yeah, so. that's yeah, right. Yeah. So Blair... I actually was introduced to the brand before y'all even started operating in Blanco. I was supposed to many times trying to interview Chris, actually. But f same kind of thing, because I know there's, a there's I wouldn't call it a heavy sourcing element to Milam Green, because you make stuff as well. But what is your point of differentiation as you go, I mean, have success in Seattle, which is great. So they must, they must have something about the whiskey. What do you, what do you, it's, what's your take on that? 100% uh, it's just we have the whiskey experts of whiskey experts yeah. working for us. Uh, Heather Green, uh, I mean, she was Anthony Bourdain's go-to for whiskey suggestions. Uh, she wrote the book Whiskey Distilled. Uh, the She moved to Texas to make whiskey specifically with us. That's, mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily the reason why her name's on the bottle, but um, it it uh, more designates uh, our transition because we did used to be Ben Milam, yeah. um, which was a fully, you know, as most craft distilleries start off being a fully sourced project. Uh, but what I love about what Heather brought into uh, to this distillery is just you can you can do it all like as long as your purpose is making the most delicious whiskey possible with the tools that you're given right and um that also means we do have to have a distiller who knows what she's doing and so we have marlene holmes who you know she was with jim beam for 25 years wow. we we are technically her retirement job because women do not know how to stop working <laughs> uh and it's and you know she's able to bring all those years of talent and expertise and and bring up a new crop of distillers. Uh, we have, uh, it's a, I would like to say Milam and Green is, it, it has a lot of experience behind us, but we're also one of the best um, bottles to, to use to teach others about sure. uh, what are all the possible ways we could be making and enjoying whiskey. Um, not, not just in the ways that we've done before, but what's the future, what's next? Absolutely. What are, yeah, and, and how can we use our tools to our advantage? Jake? How long was your grandfather at Beam? Uh, roughly 16, 17 years. He ended his career until he was about 75 as an engineer running the boiler room. Okay. Did he work with Marlene? He probably, yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to build ties. Yeah. Right? yeah that's Whiskey what... brought us together, but what if they work together? I mean, it, it shows that it's familial, the, 100%. this world of hospitality. So we've got our first of the three marks that we're sipping here with everybody. Everybody's got their whiskey there. Did Perfect. I finish it too fast? Uh, it's never too oh, fast because oh. there's always more. I got a bottle right here, apparently, this, which is really dangerous. I'm supposed to be hosting <laughs> this thing. Um, and I got enough time where y'all are talking. I can just take a slug from the bottle. But anyway, but that's not the point. So we're drinking the High Ride Bourbon from Still Austin, which I've had a couple times. Really love this. And Jordan, for you, what was kind of the philosophy? You know, Elijah Craig's a High Ride Bourbon. There's some others that are really popular. But was it the, a mash bill first kind of thing? Or were you thinking we really want to go bottled and bond first? Two elements that people when they're buying bourbon really look for. So it was the bottled and bond hadn't been spoken at the distillery until like maybe a year or two ago, oh, right? Really? We knew that it was going to be something that we inevitably do. Uh, and it's cool that we finally started that this past summer. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be doing four different ones. And uh, the second one has just released a few weeks ago. But yeah, it, it came down to the mash bill first, and, and the one we have poured here for us, we call again, is our, it's our high rye bourbon. Uh, it's actually five years old, so a little higher than a typical four-year standard for bottled and bond. But my favorite part about this particular expression of bottled and bond is that it's actually the same mash bill as our regular mainstay bourbon, the musician, ah. uh, in disguise almost, right? Um, but so it's our oldest product we've ever released. It's our original mash bill. So 
for the fans out there that have tried our musician, whether it's cash drink or the regular one, this one's definitely one worth sipping if you can get it because it's just the best iteration of what we produced, in my opinion, so mm-hmm. far. It really is. So, Making spirits in Texas is hard. Jake, I'm going to say there's probably some similar weather climate elements there, which we'll talk about in a moment. But for you, having distilled Jordan at yep. the distillery and having tasted this stuff, do you find that there's something that Texas does to the process? Either Texas gets in the way or Texas helps. You asked if it was hard to do in Texas. <laughs> I think the, the only hard part in my experience was uh, getting consumers to understand that uh, Texas is where it really have ne- has needed to be done, to be honest, since bourbon came out, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you didn't already know, whoever's listening, you know, central Texas climate, as opposed to everywhere else in the state, right? Changes so frequently, and that's important. The change of the temperature, not just too hot some days, not just too cold some days. It's that change that actually makes it easier to distill in Texas. Mm-hmm. I've always called it like a little cheat code for us, right? To, up, up, down, to, down, to, left, to, right, to, left, right. We get this. So you all get that. Yeah, right. yeah. So uh, I'm still calling it a cheat code, and it's it's only been helpful. So I would say not only is it arguably easier mm. to distill here, uh, or to age here at least, but uh, it's only been helpful for us to release release our at least our first bourbon and our first couple products at the minimum age of two years because you may or may not have been able to do that in any part of other part of the country. Yeah, I so, love that. Yeah, yeah it, we've been able to do it. And uh, again, showing that and tasting it with consumers that expected it to be too young, uh, I was surprised to hear and flattered that uh, none of them thought it was too young. So, As people existing in Texas, we suffer more than the whiskey does, is what you're saying. <laughs> this weather is, and weather's pedantic <laughs> to talk about. I get it. But like, I don't know whether to be happy or sad. Are we in winter or fall right now? It's like 90 degrees outside. It's, well, that's why I'm in a... Is it still summer? <laughs> oh, well, okay. Come on. We're making, we're grimacing. Everybody's grimacing. So, oh, yeah, Chicago. They got us so bad. You all freeze to death. Ooh. Well, I'm in a long sleeve... At least you have electricity. Anyway. <laughs> I'm in a long sleeve shirt with shorts. Like, yep. that, if that didn't explain, I don't know what sure. does. But it's hard to tell what age is quicker. Are barrels in Central Texas or me? Because... I'm really oh, God. That should be the name of a book. <laughs> Does the whiskey age me or does Texas age me more than that? Anyway. Just quote me wherever you put that. You got it. There will be no licensing fee, though, just to put it that way. All right. So I don't know much about the climate, Jake, in Melbourne, but tell me a little bit. Is it more like Scotland, which is a beautiful 55 degrees Fahrenheit all year? Is it more like Texas, where you're going to freeze to death, but then you're going to get a heat stroke within a week? Like, it's violently... Polar. What is it like there at it the is, distillery? It is the exact opposite of Scotland. Okay. Yeah, so much more uh, closer to what's happening down here. Like the average temperature in Melbourne where we're, our distillery is located is like 78 degrees oh. all year round. But there's these fluctuations that happen in the summertime that you'll go from 110 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit in just a couple of hours. Oh, wow. So those swings in temperature are really advantageous for barrel aging whiskey and very active, alive wine barrels. Um, but you also have to do sensory testing to them all the time to make sure that that whiskey is either ready to go or not ready to go. Mm. And by that, I mean, are we already imparting too much of those big jammy fruit notes you're going to get from a Shiraz? Is the barrel too dried out from Cabernet cast we Mm -hmm. we use? Or, hey, does this need another six months to a year on it before we put it into a batch of whiskey? I see. So uh, if you could, what's roughly the amount of barrels going into a batch? Um, for our core whiskeys, uh, 70 barrels. 70 and, barrels. Yeah, so we kind of do it like in quarters, and I like do it in a triangle way of we're taking about majority of the cast for our for Nova, which we'll be drinking later. It's um, mostly extra Oz cast. Okay. Then round it out with some Pinots and some Cabs to bring those drier fruit flavors to interact with the jammy fruit notes you're going to get from a Shiraz cast. Um, that way we're kind of imparting much more of a consistency to our whiskey at the end of the day. The wine heaviness, I guess you could say, not yeah. heaviness in texture, but in terms of maybe proportion of the blend, that was an intentional style that y'all were aiming for? Yeah, it was kind of the idea of not recreating the wheel of scotch and just putting it into ex-bourbon casks, mm. uh, which have been easy to do, but with this plethora of vineyards all across Australia, my boss thought, why not use what we have, the best known alcohol product of Australia that's going out to the rest of the world mm. and impart that into our distillery. I love that. Yeah, so he started buying wine barrels from day one and here we are still doing it. It's a great, I love, I love the profile of it. And, and for you, Blair, Wyoming Green, how does the, Blanco is beautiful, mind you. You all hadn't been out there. I, I, I steal some plants out there. <laughs> but don't 
say that, but I do. <laughs> How does the weather and the Texasness of Blanco affect the process there at Milam and Green? I mean, similarly to what you're talking about uh, in Melbourne, it's you, you just have to really watch your casks. Uh, I think we have the most like most observed casks um, out there because we are constantly checking on them based on what happened, you know, the day before. Because, uh, yes, it is the hill country. There are a lot of similarities to um, a, a Kentucky, you know, prairie-style climate, but or not prairie, but hill hilly yeah. climate. Uh, but it just changes within the week. We can have winter, summer, spring, and fall all in the same week in Texas. And it's, it, as, you, as you said, it, it, it can be a cheat code, but only if you are an expert hacker. <laughs> like, what, oh, that, it, which, yeah. which begs the question then. So, yes, regular checking or regular maintenance, I, I yeah. guess you'd say. What does that mean? Is that constantly looking? Is that constantly tasting? Tasting. Tasting. I mean, there there is a lot uh, that you can tell from, from color and, and just from uh, sniffing. But, um, no, we... Whenever we're, especially our rye, our pork cask finished ryes, uh, we're making sure that, especially with the pork cask, um, th those barrels are just so spongy. Spongy, <laughs> uh, that, a spongy barrel. Mm, spongy, yeah, that you that really, somewhere. I don't know where. Look, you just, you really need to be careful because uh, even a, a day past when that barrel needs to be bottled, you can start tasting, there's some off notes, some syrupiness to it, and it's, it's it's insane, um, and and honestly, when we were starting off with even the pork cask finished rye, uh, we thought we were gonna have to leave the rye in that barrel a lot longer mm. than we and you know it, and really was Marlene saying after six weeks, you know Heather, <laughs> you gotta come down and taste this barrel. I think it's I think it's ready to go. Yeah. So yeah, I love that. So we're on to mark number two. This is the Starward. Should I say Starward? I kind of say it like a last name, Starward. Like a Star Wars, right? Star Wars. That sounds great. Is that good? Yeah. All right. I don't have a great accent. As long as it's right. not Star Wars. So. Well, yeah. fair. Right. Yeah. Or St or Starland, which if you go and get all the Westland and stuff mixed up, I could or, think about that. Or Starlight. Starlight. Oh, geez, there's a general. Grimace. Or West. Or Westward. Oh. oh. Yeah. We're gonna start singing in harmony here. <laughs> yeah. This is how the Beach Boys started. Starlight. That's what I heard. Yeah. yeah. So. Tell me more about Nova. It looks like it's, this is really heavily influenced by the red wine cask. Yeah, 100%. So this is kind of like the identity, if you will, of Star Ward. It's a single malt whiskey. All of our single malts are distilled, mash fermented and distilled in the same manner. But what makes Star Ward differentiate itself based on skews is the wine cast that we mm. use. Now, majority of these casts are going to be extra Shiraz cast. And like I said a little bit ago, be ha have some Pinots and some Cabs to round it out in that 70 oh, uh, barrel blend. And we do like a slow proofing stage to bring it down to 82 proof at the end of the day. But um, the wine barrels we're using on average, we get the barrels to our distillery within two days of the wine being dumped. Mm. And all we really do is um, put a fresh coated layer of uh, steam in there to hydrate them a little bit, add a little life back into it. And we only rechar about 20% of these casts. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I mean, Are they it, pretty wet when you fill them? Very wet. We, call it a, we actually do a wet filling process. That's what we call it. Um, are they spongy though? I, I hope so. I love that term. I'm stealing that term. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. I'm sure our head to still our head uh, of operation Sam um, will be the yeah. It was a good he'll allow me to say it. Call back too. So uh, nice. See, nice. We're just making stupid pop culture references, but we get them like real time. So this is great. This is movie phone. That's oh. right. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Why don't you just tell me? That? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But like this is really what Star Wars is in the day. It's it's single malt going into Australian red wine casts blending them together, bringing it down to a lower proof, um, but adding in there those orchard fruit flavors, some jammy fruit flavors, nice pepper, peppery spiciness on the back end of it, and kind of what we were kind of creating on a daily basis. Really nice. Yeah, yeah I'm sipping this. And these have been brilliant whiskeys so far, but I, coming back from Scotland, I can yeah. see the inspiration there. For sure. I mean, like, you can remind you of a space side, for sure. Absolutely, um, and yeah. some. I, I think Abelauer is kind of a, a nice little parallel to it. Mm -hmm. Not only because... I'm going kind of too. Yeah. There's some, there's some others like yeah, that. Yeah, and like you can get a little bit of a chocolate note to it. There's this really nice strawberry vanilla f uh, flavor to it as well that's nice and delightful and easy to drink. And kind of it's the whiskey that we developed for anybody who's on their whiskey journey. If sure. they've been drinking scotch for 25 years or just getting into it right now, I think this can lend a helping hand. I love this. So what some might call intellectual property or competitive advantages. Jordan, I've been to the distillery. I've seen so many different tours. and different, I, I love y'all over there. And Chris was one Thank of the you. first interviews, you know. 
and it's in Austin, so I love San Antonio, but I'm, you know we're from Austin. I mean, you're in Buda now, so no, I'm not <laughs> casting shade, but that you're in Buda. So, but if you could say there was something that y'all did differently, something that was a different approach that you took to making these fine whiskeys, what might that be? Oh yeah, so the term for our non cash drink spirits, so the ones that we distribute right now are, is our musician, our straight bourbon and our uh, straight rye whiskey, which is 100% Texas rye. Um, we, it goes through a po- process called elevage, which mm. the term, oh, yeah. yeah. So um, the term we use now for it is slow water reduction, right? So elevage is so much sexier though. Why don't you just- I, I, I did People not, don't like the French, I get it. Well, that's, that's why fine. I still said it here because I love saying that. And uh, I think some people, it went over their heads and they lost interest as soon as you said a word they didn't understand, I maybe. See, I see. So uh, this Elevage, we're going we're gonna to call it that. Yeah, you're, we're, we're, this is an astute bunch. We got it. So this particular technique, and we did it with our bottled and bonds as well, including this high rye that we just tried. Um, basically, what that means is, is as a spirit is aging in its barrel, to not only counteract the uh, angel share as it's aging in Central Texas, but also to add complexity to the final product, mm. we actually add water to the aging barrels mm. the last six or seven months or so before we plan on bottling it. That's is, is that is is that not a cognac technique? It absolutely right? yeah. is. It absolutely is. Um, and that's where we we borrowed it. I was joking about the French. I love cognac. Yeah. All right, <laughs> Armagnac's better, but whatever. It's is fine. it uh, well? It, it was cool that we chose to use this technique, especially because Nancy Fraley uh, recommended it to us. Mm-hmm. If, if for those listening don't know who she is, uh, Google her. She's great. Uh, she's a legend. She's awesome. She's the Albert Einstein of of, of blending mm. and smelling and tasting and everything. She's she's great. So, um, so not only again does it add to the complexity and result into more liquid in each barrel by the time it's ready to barrel uh, bottle, but by the time it's done, it is comp- the spirit is completely different than right before we started adding this water. Oh. It's so different than the opposite, which is the barrel's ready to bottle. Let's dump it out. Let's add some water, mix it up, bottle it, call it a day. It is drastically different, and it's part of the reason why our, our spirits taste so well, in my opinion. I it really that. is. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm, again, there's no better job to sit with a microphone and drink. Now, yeah, literally. some people take advantage of that, I'll tell you right <laughs> now, but I'd rather y'all talk more than me. But talking about, again, competitive ingenuity or production techniques that differentiate, Jake, what do you, is there anything, I mean, besides the, the wine cask, which seems really nice and intrepid, but there's bound to be some other things that you all do to differentiate house style, so to speak. <laughs> um, you mean like the distillation? Sure. Yeah, I guess a little bit. Or like matching shoes or something at the distillery. I don't, There's a lot good. of that. A lot of flannel, I think. Good. Back yeah. There. Yeah, yeah. 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 Flannel's a thing in Melbourne. Isn't it like the most flannel outside of Seattle? Is it's, it Melbourne? That's what they say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly tied around their waist, too. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, it's a good question. Um, we actually just revamped our distillery a little over a year ago where we added bigger stills, um, added some more tanks to everything, to the whole production process. And moved barrels out of our distillery to another offsite warehouse. We have about sixteen thousand or so, eighteen thousand or so red wine cast. Holy, fully, yeah, fully wow. maturing whiskey. So oh, I, okay. I think that number right there is one of the most pivotal things you can say about Star Wars that makes it very unique and different. Absolutely, there's probably nobody else out there in the world with that number of red wine cast fully maturing whiskey. Mm-hmm. And then half of those whiskey barrels are American oak, oh. half of them are French oak. But then really? there's so many different variations of wine styles that went into those whiskeys or those barrels. So at the end of the day, when we do it, like pull out samples for our single barrel program, we're kind of like in that 160 uh, range of different kinds of samples we can pull out and wow. share to a to, to a retailer or to a club or whoever it might be and sampling those whiskeys. Obviously, I'm only going to bring like five or six, but if I wanted sure. to bring 160, I guess I could. Oh, you um, seem like you're up for it. Yeah, I am. I'm definitely up for it. I'm very uh, ambitious gentleman. Sure. But um, yeah, it, I think what it, it stands out is that we have a really diverse wood policy that we call it. Um, wood the, policy. Wood policy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm not gonna make a joke. It's yeah, very please obvious. go ahead. I'm not no, gonna make a joke about I, wood I, policy. I love asking people on my podcast what their wood policy is. So yeah. Now that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Different podcast. Though. Yeah. If they're good friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I think that. 
what our wood policy brings to our program is a complete universal diverse program that no one else can match and in that diversity we find consistency to make our whiskeys i see yeah so we're using like maybe like let's say 80 percent shiraz casts mm -hmm. and then rounding it out with pinot and um cabernet cast to make nova in that sense and then you flip it on its head with two full which is our blend of wheat and malted barley or marriage if you will of wheat and malted barley and we use majority ex cabernet casts um with the wheat barrels and the sure and the uh malted barley casts to blend that together to get consistency, which we found about two and a half years ago. And kind of relates to our bl our head blender, one of our head blenders, Carly. She's a winemaker by trade. Jared, our other head blender, co -bl head blender, he's also a winemaker by trade. Dave, the founder, was a brewer by trade. And they started learning distillation over in Tasmania from Bill Lark. So all of our brewer all of our distillers in the front of the house are brewers by trade too. Oh, good. So he brings in what, what his approach was, what the back end of Star Wars is, which is the wine barrel maturation, and to make it a, a very unified brand all at one time. I love this. So because we want to get to q and I definitely want to understand, besides the, con I, I, like Blair, when you were talking about the constant monitoring of the barrels, I just imagined a plethora of ring cameras. Which, <laughs> so, so I thought of that and I'm like, that's not gonna, that's not gonna tell you anything. No. <laughs> no one's visiting the distiller. You can't see the bubbles coming out of the cask. But for y'all, what is something that you would consider proprietary or maybe a little more innovative at the distillery there? Oh, uh, well, a couple things. One, we do have our own proprietary yeast strain. Oh, really? And Oh, yeah. And uh, mm, Wait, what? Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's, that's a Marlene uh, selection. I, I literally cannot talk anymore about it. Uh, but, yeah, I like it's, that. I mean, some of it is in just, again, coming from uh, our the experience of the people who are making the whiskey. So Marlene has years of experience. She knows what, she knows what that mash bill is going to look like. She knows what... Uh, yeast to use it's uh, it's it's all of that it is coming from experience but then I would say we're just we're open to whatever again we're open to whatever is going to get us to the most delicious thing in the bottle mm. so um, what we do that it not a lot of other uh, specifically craft distilleries do is uh, we do distill in two different states so we've got our pot still in Blanco uh, which beautiful thousand gallon Vendome pot still that oh, is Vendome. really really worth visiting uh, just just on its own, um, and then we send. Uh, actually, the reason why Marlene is not here right now is she is currently distilling in Kentucky in Bardstown. That's just like her, you know, just the, these excuses that these master distillers come up with. Um, but no, she's distilling on a column still, so we're experimenting oh. with the different uh, stills and distillation. And then, of course, uh, what I love the most is. We're sort of treating America the way Scotland treats Scotland, where when you age and when you make whiskey and age it in different areas of your country, you're going to get different results. And you can start treating the the states like a spice cabinet in order to get to, uh, you know, and unfortunately blend is not a great word in American whiskey, yeah. but it's a gr fantastic word in Scotland. So, like, why can't we... Why can't we use some of those traditions and practices here mm -hmm. to make something super delicious? And next time I go to Scotland, I'm going to say two different things. Like, I know that they exist. So, spongy scotch, which is good. <laughs> and then, what's your wood policy? So, I'm actually, these are like in the back of the head now. Mm -hmm. But we're trying now the third mark, the Milam okay. Green, the triple cask. So, tell us, yes. Blair, a little bit more about this. Well, so uh, literally, you are you are tasting the result of what happens when we distill in two different states. Oh, um, so this is uh, the younger Texas and Kentucky whiskey. Uh, we find that two years is pretty good for our Texas casks. Uh, at least three for our Kentucky casks before they come to us in Texas, and then we marry that with older Tennessee casks. And this is really uh, Heather Green's. I mean, she literally just one master blender of the year in uh, in louisville at the bourbon women's conference and it, she's she is a blender uh by absolute talent and triple cask you know unfortunately you have to it's an education bourbon because yeah. people think oh you just took whiskey from one cask and then you put it in another and then you put it in another which like I know is brilliant. like a legitimate finishing process for some whiskeys. I'm not trying to necessarily take that as a, a method away, but um, it, it, to me, it sounds very wasteful. <laughs> it's moving a lot of whiskey over and over. Uh, but for us, it means we're bringing three states worth of bourbon into one bottle. I love that. Yeah. Well, so 
This is amazing to kind of be here with y'all and drink this whiskey. So just, Darcy, give us some, some love here. How is everybody feeling about the whiskeys you've had so far? Pretty good? They're being silent. I don't know why. It should be a cheer. Oh, that's right. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a very cerebral moment. So we can, we can talk about AOCs and DOs and all that, but actually I want to get one in for me, and this will be the kind of last question before we talk to the audience and have a Q&A. So Blair, I would love to hear this answer. It's going to be really pointed for you too. So I ask every guest this on the podcast for, for many, many years now as Jake talks about wood policy. I would like to be less phallic when I ask questions like normally. So no one laughed at that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but... So, Blair, you're anywhere in the world, doesn't matter where, but you're sipping this triple cask, Milam and Green, with any actor, living or deceased, who would you love to sit, sip, and have a conversation with? Well, or definitely on the spot. I definitely mean, spot. so here's the thing it would be Weird Al, but I know Weird Al is not into whiskey. So, whoa, that's a great answer. So, I know, but it, uh, it's going to be LeVar Bird. Because oh, yeah. he loves whiskey. <laughs> He's smart and he drinks. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's the best kind of person. Yeah. No, he, and, uh, and I mean, and we could just, we could, we wouldn't necessarily just have to talk about Star Trek, even though that is um, actually my, one of my favorite stories about Milam and Green is my hiring was delayed because I had to go on the Star Trek cruise first. <laughs> uh, so I had, to, <laughs> I had a mission in front of me and I, I told Heather I'd be right back. Unfortunately, I got back uh, three days before the pandemic started. Oh, so no. I was literally on the last cruise before. Uh, yeah. Everybody yeah. out there, finally, oh, it's good to see Florian's out here. Any, raise your hand if you know Reading Rainbow. Of course, the come whole on. goddamn <laughs> yeah, room. That's right. Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, get, sing, sing it into it Google. <laughs> yes. This Book is also karaoke. <laughs> Book fairs were a thing when Reading Rainbow was around. I re that was the last time I read a book is Reading Rainbow Days. But he loves whiskey, so, you know. I love that. And Jeopardy, too, which is great. All right, Jake, for you, same question. But I would say. I'm trying to figure out if we go actor or musician with you. Let's go musician. Mm. Your whiskey, any place in the world, which musician would you love to have, living in the have a, a dram with? That's an interesting question. I guess nah, it's the, not that good. It's pretty. No, it really, it, it really is. I guess I go with uh, the guy who I've based my style and life off of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Can anybody Who's, drum roll? Because yeah. I have no uh, idea. It, their songs were playing a little bit earlier in the bar. Um, Adam Lazara, the lead singer of Taking Back Sunday. Really? Yeah. I, uh, I've i only panicked twice in front of a celebrity, if you will. And once was at the disco, obviously. Absolutely. Um, 100%. Um, I slipped and fell, and then, you know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but uh, I saw him at a bar before a show in Des Moines, Iowa, and was like, he like popped his head in, and I was like drinking a beer, and I just, like happened to turn around, and he like, kind of looked in, and I was like... <laughs> Happy birthday. I think it was his birthday. I'm not sure if it was his birthday, but that's what came out. And then the other one was Barry Alvarez, the former coach of Wisconsin football. I'm not sure why, but I like, like I like choked up and like talking to him on a plane one time. Really? Yeah. But Adam Lazara, I, would be, I don't know if he even drinks whiskey, but... But this like says so much about you that it's almost like I, I'm almost brought to tears. Okay. All because right. Because there was so much early 2000s emo playing. There earlier. was, yeah. And then minus the bear came in. I'm like, all right, well, that's yeah, my Yeah. Right? Uh, into it into it all yeah no i guess like somebody who had an influence artistically um over me and i think whiskey is an awesome art i think it's a kind of a gateway into the portal of the unseen of a place where it comes from what it represents so yeah him I love this why not it's great or book or no uh, either one yeah well you'll die in one i'll put yeah. it that way yeah yeah, yeah 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 one up and book or no yeah Jordan, all right, so it's gonna be a little bit different for you knowing that you sing you have a ponytail i want to ask you about a ponytail guy <clears throat> it's, it's a little too on the nose but lead singer let the hair down now i don't like that term. oh my god it's so well Ooh. conditioned yeah, thanks it if, actually if like only we off, filmed this can you see the, the smell lines it smells like flowers and it's great like when yeah it uh all right lead singer living or deceased who would you like to have a still austin dram with? easiest question i've ever been asked really to be more than what and, and adam lazaro's up there by the way did you just put your what? hair up <laughs> Jake put his hair up for y'all listening, and now mine's down. I never this wear it down. This is the most balanced universe I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so, uh, Gerard Way. Uh, if you, if you don't Chemical know, Romance? you got it. And I'm so glad you knew that. 
Um, wow. Believe it or not, that is my favorite band. And if you ask me, like, Jordan, what's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? I don't have a favorite anything. I like a lot of things. But if you ask me my favorite band, it, it's Mike Mike Romance. And it'd be him specifically because he's that one uh, artist and creative guy that does, he does more than music, by the way. But yes. New record I would coming be, out, too, I hear. MCR5. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's been rumored uh, for like 12 years. But... <laughs> He's he's the I know it sounds crazy. He's the one guy that like I would be pissed off if I'm on my deathbed and I haven't met him yet. So he's the guy, and I don't think he even drinks anymore. But I will gladly sip Diet Coke with him. I'll drink whatever and meet this guy. That would be so. If you can make that happen, I'm, I don't know if you have those connections. <laughs> well, had I vetted or done any happen. research before the interview, we could have made something happen. I'm sure. Oh he, my God, that's he's, amazing. He's the guy. So actually, I like. Surprises for people. No, he's not here. All right, Justin. Oh, my God. Uh, but I do know a guy that works on his tour. If so, you hook it up, I... No, no. Just, I, that would be oh. a lovely gift for you. Okay. I just... I'm not... A, I'm a... I don't... I'm a giver. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. I love that. I think that's an okay. amazing... Res- just... I, I feel like I understand y'all even better than before. Not only the whiskeys, but the individuals as well. Yeah, and just like Jake was saying, like he had... Adam Mazzaro had such an influence on who you are and the way you look. And by the way, that sums it up. You you look great. You have an awesome personality, obviously a good music taste, and that's kind of what Gerard Way is for is for me. So that's cool. I respect Anybody that. like I'm surprised. You all surprised? I thought he was going to be like a Tom Petty guy. Oh, I, 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 oh, I, I am. I'm pointing to Jordan. Right? <laughs> oh, I am. Don't get me wrong. R.I.P. But mm. Gerard's my guy. Wow, I love this. All right, so. It's been a pleasure talking about these whiskeys and being on a panel with you here in San Antonio for Bartender's Holiday. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Florian. Thanks so much for being at Blue Box here. And so now we'll just talk and have some Q&A if anybody's got any questions. And I'm going to stop recording. It's been a pleasure. If you want to apply this amazing panel of people, that'd be great. And this Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Spectacular. Thanks so much, everybody. Well, there we have it. You make whiskey wear for Bartender's Holiday in San Antonio, Texas at Blue Box. Beautiful bar. Great panel with Blair, Jordan, and Jake. Two podcasters and then me. You know, the conversation is bound to flow simply and easily. And there was a great vibe in the room with the audience. I was trying to be maybe a little more cheeky than normal because we're talking about brands so heavily. But very, very delicious whiskey from Still Austin, Milan Green, and Starward. What a privilege to get to talk to such fun people, such intelligent people, and while drinking some whiskey. Thank you, Justin Elliott, for coordinating. And this hopefully will be available through each of these brands. They find it a useful comparison of interesting whiskeys in the market. So thanks, everybody, for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter if you're not dreading, you're kind of looking forward to writing another Stubstack article, or if you're thinking... Ever since I got back from Scotland, all I'm doing is drinking scotch. Please, keep dancing. <laughs>